NASA says it's time to prioritize the planet Venus. This follows the latest discovery of viable existence in the world. In case you were to take a peek at NASA's data from the 1960s, you'll notice the Area Corporation calling Venus a planet from hell. At the same time, Mars became our destiny. Such cautious labeling of the innermost planets isn't always a twist of fate. For the duration of the turbulent space race technology, the Soviet Union turned fixated on sending highly expensive missions to Venus. The hellish planet showed little to no potential for life, but the Soviet area program didn't decommission the Venera software until the fall of the empire. Thanks to Neil deGrasse Tyson, we sooner or later recognize why. Join us as we break down the declassified pictures from Venus taken by the Soviet Union. The fall of the Soviet Union was dynamic in more ways than one. Not only did it change the geopolitical direction of the world, but the lack of the empire also sank many secrets with it. It's not unknown that the Soviets had a deep affinity for secrets, from running the most advanced intelligence organization in the world to being hush-hush about their potential alien contact. The former superpower carries numerous mysteries within itself. Believe it or not, before the United States of America took over most of the planetary efforts in outer space, the Soviet Union was leading the game. While the empire has a long history of successful and unsuccessful space missions, its biggest fixation was on the inner hellish planet Venus. In the Russian language, you'd understand Venus as Venera and, therefore, the subsequent name of the mission that spanned from 1961 to 1983. During the same time, the United States of America was busy sending its missions to the moon, so strategically, the Soviets decided to use their resources elsewhere. We cannot say that the entire obsession with the second planet from our solar is unusual. Did the Soviets plan on using the planet's surface as a possible and unbeatable military base? Or were they possibly trying to colonize the planet after searching for any forms of life up there? It's pretty tough to say why the Empire was enthusiastic about the hellish planet because the Soviets commissioned these exploration voyages during the Cold War. They weren't exactly forthcoming with their ambitions and targets. In truth, everything we know about the Venusian missions is due to unarchived and declassified evidence. Even then, it's hard to pinpoint what the Soviets were trying to find and if they cracked the secret missions. Because while the Empire did not land on Venus once, twice, or thrice, that's just basic. The Soviets launched 28 high-expensive spacecraft to the hellish planet, and 13 of those entered the Venusian ecosystem while 8 landed successfully. Such sophisticated missions had positioned the Empire in a major role in space exploration initiatives. Sure, the United States of America was a close first too, but NASA was more interested in satellites and technological configuration than exploring life on planets. Its affection for Mars came later. So, your records textbook might not tell you this, but the Soviet area software became the first corporation to send a probe into the environment of a planet other than Earth. It has another bunch of firsts on its resume as well. The USSR also became the first country to make a soft landing on another planet. It commissioned the first initiative that brought back photographs and sounds from the floor of different planets. Yep, the Soviets had their own moment of small step for a man, a massive jump for mankind, that was well before the USA. So, how come we rarely get to read about such landmark missions? Very rarely. Recall what we said about the Soviet affinity for keeping secrets? Well, this is just one of the many reasons behind the censorship of the Soviet area software. Back in 1992, the famous corporation was decommissioned in the aftermath of the USSR because the organization had to be revived with its new Russian identity, Roscosmos. Much of its archival records were either lost or destroyed. This is precisely why we don't have a clear answer for why the Soviets launched 28 spacecraft into the Venusian ecosystem. But if we had to make the most logical bet, perhaps the Soviet decision to explore Venus was about value efficiency more than anything else. This is not to say that the space program wasn't constructive about the habitability of the planet. They were searching for sustainable water presence, intensity of solar radiation, and the typical temperament of the planet. Without a series of these area missions, it would have been next to impossible to gauge Venus's excessive temperatures and thick surroundings. Of course, nowadays many cosmologists do not believe that the hellish planet can support life. The temperatures up there are excessive enough to melt lead, and water is scarce. Plus, because of its thick atmosphere, 
the air pressure on Venus is 90 times that of our planet Earth. However, those are quite recent and clear-cut tidings, and to disregard the USSR's contribution to the study of Venus is equivalent to censoring history. As far as the Soviets were concerned, Venus was worth exploring, even if it was just about galvanizing the space race. Exploring more habitable planets like Mars wasn't exactly off the table, but it was more expensive than probing into Venus. Everything just boils down to the distance from planet Earth to another cosmological body. On average, the hellish planet is only 40 million km far from our home, while Mars, on average, is 250 million kilometers away. Such big differences in distance amount to drastic differences in the fees as well. If the United States of America wasn't the world's largest economy, it wouldn't have been clean to explore Mars. Other rumors on the block also suggest that the Soviet missions were unreliable and had large technical gaps. Apparently, the spacecraft wasn't suitable to cover astronomical distances. Plus, the Enterprise had a bad trajectory of losing contact with its spacecraft. So, it makes sense why the Soviet space program changed to choosing a shorter and closer transit that would definitely yield results. Yet, if we don't bring up the space race in this context, the story of Venera missions would be incomplete. The United States of America wasn't even on the space map when the Soviet program launched the first synthetic satellite Sputnik 1 in 1957. This precise maneuver had intensified the space tussle to maintain its hegemony. However, what's really interesting is why the USA had fixated itself on the moon in the first place. Uncharted territory apart, NASA had a collection of failures with its Venus missions in the 1960s. The USA Space Organization had found itself in an impasse known as the Venus Curse. Every time they launched a probe into the Venusian atmosphere, it went horribly wrong. This is exactly when the Soviet Union saw an opportunity to capitalize on NASA's disasters. At that point, both the US and USSR were hellbent on claiming the space race. The most logical challenge was to steer away with two exceptional alternatives. It became a silent agreement. Very strategically, the Soviet area program took hold of Earth's sister planet. For the corporation, the biggest landmark in the space tussle was to do something that its aggressive counterpart had failed to do. Despite the empire's limited assets and mismanaged government, it repeatedly sent missions to Venus to find its winning role against the U.S. Rather than that, NASA had taken hold of the moon's assignment. But of course, this strategic partition wasn't without hostility and propaganda. To cover up their huge failures with Venus, the American organization was incentivized to defame the USSR's fixation with the planet. In Americanized popular media, Venus was dubbed as the hellish planet while Mars became man's destiny. These connotations didn't matter to the Soviets, though. Their only goal was to show superiority to the individuals, and well, they weren't unsuccessful in doing so. The Venera missions are almost forgotten in modern history. But despite their dated emergence, those missions were highly sophisticated, advanced, and ambitious. In fact, if we could pick an occasion that marked the dawn of the space age, the Venera explorations will definitely take the lead. Back in the 1950s, the Soviets began to experiment with the design and production specifics of the probes. And for the next 30 years, they kept building and launching interplanetary spacecraft as part of the Venera program. Since the application was running parallel with a particularly turbulent Cold War, the Soviets were fixated on optimizing their resources. Luckily for them, the early years of the war gave them more heavy lifting potential than the United States of America. That advantage proved to be extremely useful. Maximizing their capabilities, the USSR started to build and launch larger spacecraft that were designed to preserve excessive altitudes and considerable distances. The Soviets were quick to experiment with both manned and unmanned spacecraft. At the same time, the Soviet scientific community was working on a series of calculations and estimations to create accurate trajectories for the Venus missions. In the background, their Mars programs were also running effectively. For the Soviet space employer, nothing was more important than developing state-of-the-art instrumentation for those probes. This translated to the largest revelation in the records of cosmological studies. In 1966, the Soviet corporation launched Venera 3, making it the first artificial probe to enter the surroundings of Venus and effectively touch the planet's surface. This groundbreaking achievement had amplified the competition between the two superpowers.
In contrast to the American missions that were packed with failures and deadlocks, the Soviet program continued to gain traction. Despite this system's slow burn, the USSR was pulling all the strings to send successful probes into the Venusian atmosphere. The biggest problem with this trajectory was limited design capability. The Soviets were quick to overcome their design troubles and released the largest spacecraft of the Venera program in the 1970s. Their heavy lifting ability allowed them to conduct the first dual launches of Venera 4 and Venera 5. According to most historians, this was the most exciting decade of the space race. The Soviet program wasn't limited to the scope of planetary atmospheres. Rather, the Venera missions had become an official quest for signs of life. To keep up with the increasing stakes, the Soviets began to install a chemical lab on the spacecraft to examine the environment of Venus. The AREA program became successful in creating a sustainable model to search for extraterrestrial life. To take it up a notch, the USSR sent a capsule for the first time to gauge the scientific ability of Venusian weather. With the Venus probes, the Soviets managed to discover lightning, thunder, and distinct water vapor in the hellish planet's atmosphere. Based on these findings, the Soviet space program became the first agency to search for microbial life in Venus' cloud system. It kept on sending dual launches to maximize the likelihood of finding life. Finally, in 1975, Venera 9 and 10 were launched together to uncover the Soviet thesis. The highly advanced missions were successful in sending back the first images of Venus from outer space. Thanks to the durability of the spacecraft, both landers managed to capture 16 panoramic images in succession. Despite the promising headway, the Venus probes didn't last for long because of the planet's high pressure and temperature. The early attempts managed to capture images for just 60 minutes after the spacecraft had landed. To avoid future mishaps, the Soviets had to change their approach to design and build a pressurized hull that would effectively prevent excessive temperatures from melting the electronics of the spacecraft. Over the next few years, the AREA program launched six advanced missions to Venus that brought back 70 images of the planet's surface. Interestingly, all of those Soviet spacecraft had a picture of the Venusian soil, sky, and the composition of the planet's clouds. For most Soviet scientists, that was a massive win in the space race. Their sophisticated design allowed the spacecraft to remain operational for hours in a single attempt. The record-breaking timeline of the Venus missions also captured the solar spectrum for the first time in history. Today, this USSR space trajectory is remembered as the Soviet Union's most significant contribution to the planetary examination. It's almost odd how this ambitious space software got decommissioned after the dissolution of the empire. But the immediate succession of Roscosmos doesn't have a clear answer for that. In truth, the USA is responsible for dissolving the program. According to Neil deGrasse Tyson, it's because of the American-led sanctions that such an advanced space agency fell apart. To maintain its hegemonic role, the United States of America imposed political and economic bans on the Soviet Union. This resulted in one of the world's largest economic collapses. In return, the United States of America continued to invest in its cosmological abilities. So while the USA had lost the Venusian race, it took the lead in exploring other habitable planets. This is how Mars came into the picture. Over the next decade, NASA actively commissioned programs that would garner the best results. Rather than that, the Soviet space program became obsolete and unarchived. The last few missions to Venus were active attempts to preserve the spacecraft and landers, but without adequate monetary input, they couldn't make it. This might be one of the biggest losses for the USSR's intellectual community. Today, the strategic success of the Venus missions remains unparalleled. If there wasn't a political incentive, perhaps the Soviet Union would have shared its data with NASA, and together they could have created the best software to explore the entire universe. Despite the Empire's obsession with secrecy, it doesn't seem like such a bad option in retrospect. Even now, we lack data to understand the temperate model of Venus surroundings. NASA has been using its telemetry from the 60s and 70s to gauge the possibilities of extraterrestrial lifestyles, but perhaps that's not enough. At least now we can appreciate the remarkable impact that the Venus missions have had on humanity.